Today in small group leadership, we're going to get a little bit deeper into one of our five things. Now, from last class, we looked at Acts chapter 2, and the last bit of Acts chapter 2, we looked at the secret sauce of the early church, what made it so strong. And we had five basic elements that we see that they were devoted to. Um, do you guys remember any of them? They were devoted to the Word. Anybody else can remember? To each other. To each other. Prayer and worship. That's right. Worship, prayer and worship. Serving. Serving. Evangelism. Evangelism. Tanner gets a blue star because he was able to do that without looking at his notes. Uh, <laughs> And that's good, too, because this is, these five things are important to keep in mind when you're outside of the classroom. There's some things that you know, we teach that we would like you to remember, uh, and then there's other things we teach that we want you to know. Uh, and there's a bit of a difference. Something that you remember is if somebody asks you a question, you might, oh, oh maybe. But something you know is something that's always present with you. And it's important as a small group leader to always be mindful of these things. Because if we focus too much on one or two and leave out the others, uh, your group gets out of balance and it becomes weaker. Um, so that way, that's the primary reason why we need to remember these things and know them all the time is because knowing all five of these things is very important for a balanced group. And if we only remember them if asked or have to look it up, chances are the way we're leading our group we're gonna be out of whack in at least one of these. I'm gonna tell you a little story, and it's so unfair to poor Carlos, but uh, the young man named Carlos. Carlos, when I first started in ministry as a youth pastor, Carlos was a kid in my youth group. And when I first started off, I wanted to know where my kids were at. What did they understand? What did they not understand? Um, where their basic level of knowledge was, so I could teach them appropriately. And I remember asking Carlos, and I asked the, the whole group, uh, what is grace? And I remember Carlos saying, I'm not sure, but it's something about deer. And I thought, deer? <laughs> he says, yeah, well, I've heard that deer are graceful. But I don't know why we sing about that in church. Okay, for Carlos, and I mean, cut him some slack. He's a kid in grade 11. Uh, but, but Carlos, no one had ever defined the word grace for him. Uh, and so in his mind, grace was this very vague, fuzzy kind of thing. Um, and he had heard it in conversation, you know, the deer are graceful, and so grace has something to do with deer, uh, but why we'd sing how amazing it is or anything else like that, he didn't have a clue. Uh, and he wasn't alone in the youth group. I remember Amy, um, you know, she attempted to give a better answer, and she said, well, grace is amazing, it sounds sweet, and it saves wretches like me. I was like... <laughs> Okay, there's three principal problems when things are really cloudy in our head. Uh, the first is you cannot discern what you do not know. There are a lot of cult groups that prey on our fuzzy understanding of things. I remember a number of years ago, and it's here in this local area, uh, there was a, a cult group that would specifically infiltrate churches and they would target uh, people in their early 20s. And one of the things this cult leader would do was redefine the word worship. Now, if you didn't have a real clear idea what worship meant, um, then you were a perfect candidate for this guy. And what he would do is he would redefine the word worship in that worship meant total submission to a true man of God, a.k.a. him. And once he got you to buy into that definition of worship, he could go to the Bible and say, hey, look at this. We have to worship in spirit and truth. 
Oh, so the Bible's telling you, you have to submit to me. Sell all your goods and move out to my strawberry farm and work on my compound. And we saw a lot of people, not necessarily join the cult, but certainly very damaged by this guy. And quite frankly, one of the worship leaders at our church um, ended up joining the cult. And 20 years later, he's still with that cult, picking strawberries. Um, so, but if things are fuzzy in our head, we can't discern right or wrong. Anybody could have gone up to Carlos with any definition of grace, and if the only thing he has to compare it to is something about deer, <laughs> uh, Carlos is hooped. Um, second thing is, you can't share what you don't know. If Carlos is talking to a friend, his friend's curious about God, and they get into a deep conversation, can Carlos tell them anything about grace? Absolutely not. Um, let me tell you about something wonderful about God, something about dearness. Um, it's impossible to communicate what is really cloudy in your own head. And then thirdly, you cannot apply what you do not know. Now, Carlos is no longer uh, in the 11th grade. Uh, he's in his 30s. He's an architect. Uh, he's a leader in his church, so he knows what grace is now. But at the time, how is vague something about deer going to have any impact on his life? How is that going to encourage him? How is that going to guide him? How is he going to apply that? Uh, how is that even going to be remotely relevant? If a pastor starts preaching about grace, what's, good, what's Carlos going to do? He's going to doze off because it doesn't make any sense. You cannot apply what you do not know. Now, because of these, that's why we usually put it number one when we're doing small groups, this dedication to the Word. Um, now, why do we do this? Well, because the Word keeps us from heresy. As I mentioned last time, what this is going to do, this is the keel that will keep your ship going straight. Uh, you're not going to get blown off course when you stick to the word. Now, here at our church, have we had problems uh, with small groups getting blown off course? Yes, we have. Not many, uh, but we certainly have had you know, a significant one where a group is blown off course. But it was blown off course because they weren't using the word. They were following somebody else's teaching. Um, and members of our congregation and all congregations can go down weird, 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 weird roads uh, because they start following teachers who aren't really focused on what the Word says. And they've got crazy conspiracy theories or this idea or that idea or taking passages way out of context. Um, when that happens, yeah, you're a sucker for false teachers. You're a sucker to be manipulated, to be taken advantage of, um, sometimes cults. And there's a lot of things that can mess you up. And there's a real personal danger, not just sort of, you know, I'm going to join a cult and be selling flowers at the airport. But there's a, a personal danger in that Jesus said that know the truth and the truth will set you free. The logical other side of that statement is if knowing truth sets you free, believing a lie will put you in bondage. And whenever we believe in any kind of a false teaching, uh, it will mess us up inside. And it will mess up our lives and it will mess up our relationships. Which is why good teaching is so, so important. Just letting you sort of a sneak peek into a, the world of pastoral counseling. Uh, Many, many of us pastors, when somebody comes into our office and they're struggling with an issue, one of the first things that goes through our mind is this grid. Know the truth and truth will set you free. So if we see someone coming into our office who are locked in bondage of some kind, what we're trying to do is figure out, okay, well, where is the lie that is being believed? And what is the appropriate truth that needs to come in here to set this person free? But the word is what keeps us from heresy. The Word, of course, gives us knowledge. Uh, it tells us so many cool things about God. It informs us. It makes us wiser. Um, this almost goes without saying. But yeah, the more we dig into the Word, the more we focus on the Word, the more we're going to know. 
Um, when I went to university, I went to a secular university, not a Christian one, and I saw plenty of Christian kids lose their faith in university. And the number one reason was they didn't know what they believed and they didn't know why they believed it. If you had that basic knowledge, hey, you know what? University was not a threat at all. Uh, in fact, it was a time when we saw many, many, many new people come to the Lord uh, was through university. But if you don't have any knowledge and this is a foreign book to you, yeah, you're in trouble. The Word gives us direction. Uh, the Bible tells us how to lead our lives, how to live our lives. Again, back to pastoral counseling. Uh, when people come to me with messed up marriages, messed up relationships, messed up lots of stuff, um, the antidote, I mean, it's not truth just for knowledge's sake. It's what do I do with my life? Uh, the Bible talks about itself is thy word. Sorry, because I learned this as a child. I remember in King James. Uh, thy word is a lamp unto your feet. Okay, that implies movement. Uh, it's guidance, it's wisdom, it's knowledge. We can see and we're moving. So the Bible and focusing on the Bible will change our lives, change our direction in life, change our destination. Uh, it equips us for action. And that is the focus really of what we call this dynamic Bible study method where everything is discussion-based rather than you know talking head-based. The discussion base is because we want people to walk out differently. We want people who come to our study to leave the room as different people, with a new plan of action, a new outlook on life, and we want it to make an actual real impact. And if you haven't led a study before or led a small group before, that is actually one of the most thrilling and fulfilling elements of small group leadership, is that we get to see people's lives changed and transformed. And the changes and transformations we see in people's lives, they're going to last for decades. Uh, yeah, it's an amazing part. Uh, so the focus on the word, just so, so, so central. And fundamentally, it brings us closer to God. This is God's revelation to us. It's God disclosing himself to us. And the more we get into his word, uh, the more we get to know him. It's one of the things that makes the Bible so different than any other book is only when you read the Bible is the author of the book sitting next to you. And the purpose of the Bible is not to get to know the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is to get to know God. And when we read his word, uh, we grow closer and closer to him. So that's why we focus so much on the Word. Well, how do we read our Bible? And this is something that a lot of people don't understand immediately. Uh, and I call it sort of the difference between fine wine and light beer. Now, I am not a connoisseur of either wine or beer. Uh, but I've observed people who engage in both of those beverages. Most people treat every book, the Bible included, like light beer. You just grab it, toss it down, and you're done. They read the Bible with the same care and attention as they read an Archie comic. And that works for most books because most books, yeah, are kind of light beer books. They're just meant to be thrown back. They're quick, easy reads. The Bible is not like that at all. It's more like fine wine. And I don't know if you've ever talked to somebody who talks about fine wine, but they'll talk about how a glass of wine will have a bouquet. So they'll, they'll smell it and they'll... Hints of lavender or earthy tones. <laughs> and I, I, I prefer grape juice. But uh, I, I'm a little envious because they can talk about all these cool things about what they smell in the bouquet. They swish it around in their glasses, and then they'll talk about how the wine has legs and how it comes down the sides of their glasses. I don't understand the point of that, but they're really, really into this glass. And then when they take it, they don't just throw it down. They just take a little sip. They swish it around. Uh, they taste the primary taste, secondary and tertiary, and they'll talk about different aftertastes. I know a guy... And I hope you guys get to meet him, a guy named Keith Kitchen, who's a coffee fanatic. 
uh, and he does the exact same thing. He buys his own beans, roasts his own beans. He's got a special coffee grinder, very expensive coffee grinder. So he says, if the particles are too big, the coffee is sour. If it's too small, it's bitter. And if you've got an imprecise grinder, you'll get some big, some small particles in the same thing. It's bad coffee. Uh, so, I mean, he get the, dials things down to the micron on how he wants his, his coffee ground. Uh, the temperature, the pressure. He's a mad scientist of coffee. And when he has his coffee, he says, you know, try this blend. You know, you can hit, listen to that. There's bits of blueberry. Now, wait for it, wait for it. And then a bit of a chocolate after taste comes in. I mean, like he's into his coffee. But that's the way we're supposed to read the Bible. The Bible is not supposed to be just tossed back like Kool-Aid. It's supposed to be savored. Um, we're supposed to focus on it. It's supposed to be read slowly, uh, deliberately, uh, very mindfully. When we read our Bible, we should always be aware on the ultimate author. Yeah, we have the human author. Uh, could be Paul, could be Jeremiah, could be Amos, uh, could be an unknown author. We don't know who wrote Chronicles, for example, or Ruth. Uh, but the ultimate author is God. And when we read this, we should always keep that in the forefront of our, our minds, that this is what God is saying to me. We would talk about if we got a signal from outer space from an alien civilization around another star. You know what? That'd be a pretty big deal. That'd be big news. You know, what do these aliens have to say? Fortunately, because of distances, it would take a real, real long way, well, time to talk to them. But if we got a message from another civilization, from another alien race, that would be a big, big deal. This isn't just from another alien race. This is from the creator of the entire universe. And he's writing specifically to you. Um, read it with the same gravity that you understand that. Uh, know that God is saying something to me. And as I mentioned before, be mindful that the author is present. Reading your Bible should be part of an act of prayer. God is with you when you're reading. He actually is communicating to you. This isn't just something that was written thousands of years ago. The author still means this today, and he means it for you today. Listen to his voice. When you read scripture, listen to the author as he's sitting right beside you. Because God will, especially if you read this very mindfully, uh, he'll point out how this applies to you. Uh, he'll give you encouraging words and occasionally apply his very loving, very large foot to your backside. Uh, call it foot to butt combat. Uh, he'll let us know. It's so one of the things that uh, the Bible tells us, uh, talks about something called the illumination of the Holy Spirit, that God himself will show us what he means when we read his word, when we take it seriously. Uh, he'll explain how this applies to us. So that's important as we read our Bible, and to communicate that. When we read our Bible, especially when we're leading a small group, uh, I cannot emphasize this enough. Context, 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 context. Uh, I'd mentioned to you guys earlier before class that when I was teaching my other class, we had um, a number of students who would prepare had sort of ignored my previous advice to pay attention to the context and thought that that was maybe just an extra bonus stuff and not really the heart of the matter. And all three of them, by ignoring the context, completely missed what the Bible was saying. And two of them, it kind of got weird. Uh, one was harmless, but had nothing to do with the Bible, what the Bible was saying. And, and two, yeah, it got a little bit strange. Um, Pay attention to the context. Um, paying attention to the context keeps us from weird heresy and strange and bad advice. Uh, I remember years and years ago coming across a young man oblivious to the whole concept of context. And he thought the Bible was a false book because he had opened it up and read the story about Lot and his daughters. 
Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the story of Lot and his daughters, um, Lot and his daughters are living way up in the hills, far away from anybody else. Daughters don't have any husbands, so they get dad drunk and they sleep with him. Now, this young man didn't understand that just because the Bible tells that story doesn't mean that the Bible is telling us to do that. Uh, and that's why context is so crazy important. Uh, just because something the Bible describes something doesn't mean it prescribes that. doesn't mean it's telling us that, oh yeah, well, you should do it likewise. Um, so context, really, really, really important. I mentioned, I thought I mentioned last class uh, when I was living in England, how I saw a poster nailed to a church bulletin board by the local Communist Party that said, even the Bible says there is no God. And it's true. The Bible does, in fact, say there is no God. Right before it says, only the fool says in his heart. But, uh, yeah, we can be blown off course. We can get into really wacky, weird stuff. Uh, when we don't pay attention to context. So that's just important. Now, how do we do that? Some of it is pretty simple. Is our passage from the Old Testament or the New Testament? Is this from the part of history that's sort of the prelude leading up to Jesus, or is it after Jesus? Uh, that's going to make a big difference on how we understand the text. When in history is this happening? That makes a big difference. What's going on in their world? What is the theme and the point of the book we're reading? That's going to make a big difference on how we understand it. When we read Galatians, you know what? It's a good idea if we know who wrote Galatians, who he's writing Galatians to, what are they struggling with, what's their deal? Why is Paul writing this book? That's important to understand in context. What is the genre of the passage? Some parts of scripture are poetry. Uh, just because something's poetic doesn't mean that it's not true, but it's just true in a different sense. So the 23rd Psalm talks about the valley of the shadow of death. Now, if you're going to be an archaeologist and you go running around looking from the valley of the shadow of death, you're totally missing the point. Um, when Jesus says, I am the door, and if you think that Jesus somehow has hinges, you're really missing the point. <laughs> so pay attention to the genre of the passage. Is this a teaching passage? Is it a legal passage? Is it poetry? Is it parable? Is it history? What's going on here in the passage? What kind of passage is it? Is it a prayer? Is it a complaint? And the super obvious one is, read the surrounding verses. What is this passage talking about? Read a few verses before, read a few verses after. Get a sense of what is going on here. Now that's just part of your prep. When you begin your study, make sure you share some of this with your, the people you're leading. So they can understand how this verse fits in. Part of it is just so they'll understand what the heck you're talking about while you're leading your study. But also, so they can understand the concept of context. Because without context, things get really, really weird. I think last week we talked a little bit about how that one false teacher took uh, Habakkuk, uh, chapter 2, out of context. Like, way crazy out of context. Okay? We need to teach the people not only what we're studying that day, but some basic principles. Uh, so they don't get led down some weird path. Okay, we talked about last time the three basic questions. Uh, of what, so what, and now what. So when we're, we're focused on the word, we don't use these questions just because they stimulate good discussion. Although, if used properly, they will stimulate good discussion. Uh, but these questions are very theologically sound. Focusing on the what. 
you know what? We do need to know what God is actually saying. What is he trying to communicate to us? Uh, this isn't about what our own invention is, and that's where we get abuses of context, is somebody will have some kind of an idea, I want to get across this point, and I can stretch this verse and bend it out of shape to try to make it mean what I say. Uh, no, don't do that. Find out what God is trying to say. That's why context is so important. What? Really, really critical. The so what? Okay, we do need to understand why this is important. If God is saying something, why is he saying it? Why do we need to know? And this will also build motivation for the now what? Because God, this isn't the book of trivia that, oh, that's nice to know. No, this is a call to action. This book is meant to transform our lives and bring us closer to our relationship with God. It's meant to make a difference in us. And those now what questions when we're leading our, our small groups, those are so critical. Not that these ones aren't. These build the foundation, but it's your now what questions. That's when lives get changed. This builds understanding, and without these, lives aren't going to get changed either. But this is where things really start to happen. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Bible translations. We're just going to talk about the tools that you use in a good word-focused Bible study. And it's going to start off with the Bibles that you use. Now, the first thing I'd say about using Bible translations is know your audience. Who is in your small group? Are they adults? Are they children? Are they white collar? Are they blue collar? Are they professors? Are they students? Is English their mother tongue or are they new English speakers? Knowing your audience is key in picking the most appropriate translation. Now, when we do pick Bible translations, there's a, there's a broad spectrum uh, that start off from very literal word-for-word -word translations, uh, move over to what we call a dynamic equivalence in the middle, and then sort of a thought-for-thought translation at the very end, the very non-literal translation, sometimes called paraphrases. Um, and so there's this broad spectrum of translations, and they all have their different uses, and they have their different purposes. So with our literal translations, the most literal, and some people think, well, literal is obviously the best. Let's go literal, uh, because I want to know, I don't want to have any else tell me what you know John said I want to know what John actually said and you can do that um, but if you're gonna get like you know I want to know what John said I can tell you what John said uh, John 1 1 for example says this NRK in halagas kai halagas in pros ton theon kai theos in halagas man that's John's words which is cool because wow but I don't know if you guys understood anything of what I said. Uh, maybe a word, but I doubt it. Uh, so the original, unless you want to study flash, I hated languages, uh, flashcards and grammar, not going to help you that much. But you can go for a translation. I've got one, something, this is called an interlinear um, New Testament, where you get a real, real word-for-word -word translation. Uh, and I'm just going to read just a little section here uh, so you can get a sense of how word-for-word -word translations uh, sound. They indeed then departed rejoicing from presence of the Sanhedrin. For on behalf, behalf of name his... They were deemed worthy to be dishonored every and day in the temple and house to house, not they ceased teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus the Christ. That's word for word. Does that make much sense? No, <laughs> it doesn't make much sense. Uh, translating any kind of language word for word um, Ignores grammar, syntax, the fact that we don't have words for this, some of their words. Uh, 
word order, particularly in the Greek language, Hebrew is a little bit more, makes a little more sense, but word order is just crazy um, in a word for word translation. Um, word for word, exactly word for word, I mean, it has its use, but not in general reading and usage. Uh, yeah, it's not going to be helpful. And I think of most of you have taken uh, some French in your life. Uh, the challenges of word for word can be seen in uh, the French word, I guess technically words, uh, pomme de terre, which some of you might remember means apple of the earth. Now, if you translate apple of the earth, that can cause a lot of confusion in English. Uh, for any of you who've been on a farm, you may have heard of something known as a road apple. Uh, and if you haven't been on a farm, I'll just let you know, road apples are what horses leave behind. Uh, on the road, and you don't want to be eating them. Um, you might think, oh, apple of the earth, you mean kind of like a road apple. No, it's not kind of like a road apple. Pomme de terre, apple of the earth, actually refers to a potato. But if you translate that word for word, apple of the earth, boy, that's going to cause a lot of confusion and misunderstanding. So word for word isn't always great. Now, not quite word for word, but pretty new word for word is the New American Standard. Uh, it is, of the English translations, probably the most word for word and still yet makes sense. Uh, but because it's trying to keep very close to the Greek grammar and structure, it's not an easy translation to read. It's awkward. Uh, it's kind of stutters and humbles along, which, which is ironic because the Bible was actually written in really easy to read Greek. Paul, maybe not so much. John, definitely. Um, but in the original language, this is one of the reasons why a lot of pagans didn't like the Bible, because this wasn't written in formal uppity language. No, this was everyday street Greek in which the Bible was written. So it was really easy to read. Everybody can understand what he was talking about. New American Standard, not everybody can understand that. It does not come as easy street English. Uh, far from it. Um, English Standard Version. This is sort of a newer version, uh, not directly related to the American Standard, but um, it is a pretty literal translation. Um, I've got a little bit of a soft spot for it because some of my professors at seminary were responsible for this. Um, but still, for private study and for someone who's very well educated, it's not a bad version. Uh, if someone's not well educated or well Christianized, they're not going to make a lot of sense. I mean, it's going to be better than the original languages, but it's going to be tough. And then these, I would say, would be the worst of the literal translations, would be the King James and the New King James. King James... Yeah, it's pretty literal-ish. Uh, there's mistakes in the King James, partially because of the manuscripts they were using weren't, weren't the oldest, most reliable manuscripts, uh, and partially because sometimes they didn't know what words meant. So, for example, in the King James Bible, you're going to hear see the Bible talk about unicorns. Now, cut the guy some slack. It was 1611. Uh, they came across some words. They didn't know what they were. They didn't know that much about the world, and they kind of thought unicorns were a thing. And I thought, oh, maybe they were first unicorns. We're going to go with that. Uh, so, I mean, there, there's, there's goofiness in there. If you're really, really Shakespearean, yeah, King James is great. It's a beautiful translation. But I would not ever, ever use that from the pulpit. I would certainly never use that in, in teaching people, particularly new believers or people who are not yet Christians. Uh, yeah, it's a terrible, terrible choice. Uh, New King James seeks to improve a little bit of the language of the old King James, but still is pretty awkward for reading. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, this is from the King James, where it's a little bit too word for word. There is the passage, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And there is therefore now no. Hold a second. There is therefore now no. Okay, that word order in English is rubbish. Um, 
That's it's terrible word order. Uh, now I know why it's there because I know there's a grammar rule in Greek, and I don't know why it's there, but there's a grammar rule in Greek that you can't start a sentence with therefore, and so they'll stick it in as like the second word. Uh, so that's why it says there is therefore now no. But if you rearrange the order, therefore there is no. Okay, that makes sense. But the King James and the New King James, to a little lesser extent, struggles with those kinds of things, where it's maybe a little bit too word for word, and that makes terrible English that people don't understand. And if people aren't understanding the Bible, you might as well be reading the Greek version. Um, if they do understand, again, you're dealing with a very Christianized group of people or very educated people, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and if they happen to be Shakespeare nuts, yeah, King James, have fun. Uh, otherwise, it's not something that I'd recommend. At the other end of the spectrum are are paraphrase or paraphrase translations. Um, the message is a good example of this. Now, there's a little debate on use word usage uh, on what this is. It is an actual translation. So Eugene Peterson, also one of my professors, um, he actually is a very competent Greek and Hebrew scholar. And so he was reading the original languages and translating it into English. However, his method wasn't word for word or even sentence for sentence. It was this kind of this thought for thought, idea for idea. And even if there was uh, a Greek or Hebrew figure of speech, he wouldn't translate that figure of speech because it might not make sense to us. He would just come up with an English equivalent figure of speech that explained the same general idea. The benefit of the message is that it does recapture that street Greek, street Hebrew feel of the Bible. Um, you might find it very, very refreshing to read. Um, very, very enjoyable. And you'll see that new light on things. Uh, the weakness of it is that the message, while it is a translation of the Bible, it's got a lot of Eugene Peterson's own interpretation of what it's trying to say. And so you're really, really reading through the translator's lens on what a passage is trying to get at because he's, he's not leaving that up to you to figure that out. He's putting his own spin on it. And that's inevitable with uh, those kinds of translations. The other version of this, and this is not a translation, it is a true paraphrase, is the Living Bible. Now, the story behind the Living Bible is there was this guy, and I can't remember his name, but he had a copy of the American Standard Version, which is, like, you know, the New American Standard? Well, this is the Old American Standard. And he realized his kids were having difficulty reading their Bibles, which makes perfect sense if you've ever picked up you know, King James or those Bibles. They're very hard to read. And so he didn't know Hebrew or Greek or anything like that. He just had a hard English translation and just tried to paraphrase it to be really easy to read. Now, this man was tremendously gifted in his ability to express things in English. And so the Living Bible, uh, particularly when it came out in the 60s, early 70s, wow, did it break ground. Um, and if you see a Living Bible, often they'll have a bunch of hippies printed on the front cover of the Living Bible, because that's when it came out. Uh, <laughs> and boy, those hippies snapped that up. And, and good thing, too, because compared to the King James, this is crazy easy to because it was made for somebody's children. The problem with the Living Bible, it's not particularly accurate because this guy, again, couldn't read Hebrew or Greek and paraphrasing things, like if Eugene Peterson has a lot of his own views in the message, this guy has way more. Uh, and so it's not always the most accurate and not necessarily the most reliable. In the middle, and this is where I think is usually the sweet spot, are the dynamic translations. Um, sometimes they refer to a principle called dynamic equivalence. Fancy word meaning sort of thought for thought. Um, the f most popular of these is the, new, the NIV, the New International Version. Now, New International Version came out, I think, in 1973. Uh, it's not exactly that new anymore. Uh, but it is a great translation. It's very accurate. 
Uh, it doesn't sound as wooden or as harsh as the New American Standard or the ESV or some of those. So it's a, it's a fine translation. Um, so my professors are responsible for some of it too. So I've got a little tie to it. But it does have some weaknesses. For example, um, one of the passages in the NIV talks about how our sins have separated us in Isaiah. How our sins have separated us of us. How our sins have separated us from our God and our iniquities have hidden his face from us. Now, I don't know about you, but that word iniquities, I love the word iniquities. Uh, I just like how it sounds, iniquities. It has these this dark connotations. Uh, you can sort of feel the corruption uh, in it. Uh, there's this air of malevolence behind the word iniquities. I love I love how the NIV guys translated that, that verse. It's fantastic. However, if I say that verse from the pulpit, I know that 30% of the congregation are not going to know what it, the word iniquities means. Or, if I use the word malevolent, maybe 40% won't know what that word means. Um, and which 30% won't know? The most vulnerable 30%. The 30% who needs to understand this the most aren't going to understand what I'm talking about. So that's even with the NIV. Now, New American Standard, that many times worse. King James, 10 times worse. Uh, the most vulnerable people who need to hear what you say the most are not going to understand what you're saying. Which is why my personal favorite for preaching and teaching uh, is the New Living. New Living, for me, seems to have just the right sweet spot. Very easy uh, to understand, uh, very easy for people to grasp, uh, and it's still a fluid translation. It is based on the Old Living Bible, where people recognize that, boy, this guy really had a, a fantastic command of the English language, but he's not particularly accurate. So let's do a real translation by using some of the very best scholars uh, that we have access to, but let's translate it still keeping the old living Bible style and flair and ease of use. And so that's the origin of that, that new living translation. And uh, here at our church, when someone becomes a believer, we give them a copy of this, uh, the new believers edition of the new living translation, because it's so easy to read. And I was just talking to um, a young lady, a university student, three days ago, on Saturday, um, who would, was raised Catholic and then came to our church and received one of these Bibles. And wow, this is like way easier to read than anything I'd ever picked up before. I could never understand what the Bible said. Um, this is so different. And she wanted to know why it was so different. Uh, but great translation. There's another translation that I'm, I'm going to show you, and it's the New International Reader's Version, sometimes the, the NI small rv. The NIV is written at a grade 8 level of English. New Living at a grade 6. The NIRV at a grade 2. Um, really, really easy uh, to read. However, there's a problem with grade two English, uh, is that this sounds, I call it the Dick and Jane Bible. And I'm just going to read a little bit from you. Uh, this is from part of the Christmas story. She became pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, was a godly man. He did not want to put her to shame publicly. So he planned to divorce her quietly. But as Joseph was thinking about this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. The angel said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. The baby inside her is from the Holy Spirit. She is going to have a son. You must give him the name Jesus. That is because he will save his people from his sins. Wherever there's a compound sentence, this will chop it up into simple ones. And so this is not a fluid translation that's easy to read. It's... Now, if you are a child... Oh yeah, that, there's a reason why we give our elementary age children the NIRV. 
in this church. Because if you are a child and Dick and Jane is your reading level, this is perfect. Um, our church has also bought a um, hundred of these, and we sent it to our Bible school in Thailand. One of the things I noticed earlier this year when I was teaching in Thailand was that a lot of my students uh, spoke English as a second language and really struggled with English. And they've got ESVs and King James Bibles or whatever, like, and I'm looking at them and they're like, what? Just such confusion and fog in their faces because they're using uh, an English translation as way, way, way above their level. Uh, and so we got, not the ones with Noah's Ark on them, we got the more adult NIRV. But we sent um, like four cases of these to Thailand. And actually just this last week, I got uh, a Facebook message from one of those students who struggled with English and in his own broken English way expressed tremendous gratitude because, wow, is this Bible so much easier to read than what he was using and how the Bible's making so much more sense to him. As I mentioned at the beginning, your choice of translation depends on your audience. So if you're dealing with people who are weak in the English language or are children, the NIRV is a fantastic uh, choice. Otherwise, yeah, it's, it's just maybe New Living. And yeah, if you're, you've got a group of very experienced Christians, um, New American Standard or ESV are, are fine translations. Does that make any sense? Now, before we move on from translations, do you guys have any questions about translations or anything specific? Well, uh, every day I read to my sister, and she's a teenager, so it's really like, well, it's like use. Ah, maybe the, the NLT would probably be the easiest. There is a message right now. Oh, message is fine too. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, you can't go wrong with those ones. Uh, yeah, I like the message every once in a while will throw some difficult vocabulary at you. Uh, now, I may not be remembering this accurately, so don't quote me, quote me on it. It's a shame because this is, we're recording this. But uh, there's bits of French in the message. And I am pretty darn sure uh, there's the phrase raison d'etre uh, in the message. And that phrase means reason for existing. And it's something that very educated, fancy, schmancy people will say. Uh, I'll talk about something that's very uh, It's kind of like deja vu, but even worse. Uh, so every once in a while, yeah, you have to be pretty educated to know what he's talking about. But that's not super common. But yeah, every once in a while, the message uh, isn't quite as easy to read as you might imagine. Um, another tool, and it's a tool most people use incorrectly, but one I wanted to talk about is Strong's Concordance. Strong's Concordance is actually a very useful tool, um, but it is a lousy topical index. Now what most people use Strong's for, or any concordance, is yeah, a topical index where oh, I want to read about love, or I'm going to lead a Bible study about love, or I'm going to preach about love. So I'll grab Strong's and look at the verses about love. And there's 848 verses about love. Uh, holy camoly. Uh, yikes. Um, and so using it as a topical index, topical index is a really weak way. It's not the way it was intended to be used. Um, what it was intended to be used is to help you solve, particularly from a beginner level, translation problems. Now there are translation problems that sometimes we come across. Just like when I talked about the French, uh, pomme de terre means potato. Sometimes a word in one language won't have exactly an equivalent language in another. So I remember years ago when I was early on in my, my Christian faith. Uh, I'd maybe been a Christian for a year or two. And I came across this passage written by the Apostle Paul that talks about how we have the hope of eternal life. And I was upset by this because the English word hope refers to a future expectation that we're uncertain about. 
like I hope I'm going to win the lottery. Uh, I hope the Oilers are going to win the Stanley Cup. Um, something I don't know, but you know, I, I wish for. And so when I say like the Apostle Paul is talking about that we have the hope of eternal life, like what do you mean we don't know? Like I'm investing my whole life on this, and if you don't know, and this is the Bible doesn't know if it's true or not, uh, wow, that's that's a problem. Uh, so I was kind of upset about you know what's going on here. Then I discovered that the word for hope there obviously isn't hope because that's an English word. The word is actually a Greek word, elpis. And the word elpis doesn't mean the same thing as the English word hope. Nearly. The word elpis refers to a future expectation, just like hope does. But the difference is elpis refers to a future expectation that you're confident about, that I know this is going to happen. Where hope is a future expectation that I don't know is going to happen. I hope it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Um, where elpis is... I check the weather forecast. I've seen the satellite report. I know it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Uh, so when Paul talks about we have the hope of eternal life, it's a confident hope. We know this is going to happen. Now, how do you get access to that kind of information? How do you know what it says in the original language and you don't want to have to learn and spend years uh, of real pain in the butt studying to learn Hebrew and Greek? Well, that's what Strong's does. What you will find in Strong's is, and this is how you should be using it. If you're reading a passage, so you've already got your Bible verse in front of you, and it has the word hope, and you want to know what hope means. Well, you know, you can look up hope here, and since you already know what Bible verse it is, you can look up hope, okay, because I'm in Second Hesitation 4.12. I just made that book up, but... Uh, look up hope and you'll see oh yeah there it is there's my verse and then you look at the end and there will be a number 2122 now know, you need to know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, Old Testament is Hebrew New Testament is Greek but once you find that number then at the back of Strong's Concordance and you'll have to go to make sure you go to the right section uh, it'll be pretty clear if you go to the wrong. And then you look up 2122, and then you'll see, ah, Elpis in the original language, which means a confident hope or a future expectation. So that is what Strong's is primarily useful for. And although some of you are fairly new at leading small group studies, I'm sure you've come across a Bible verse where different translations render it differently and they all seem to be translating some word differently and you're sort of wondering, well, I wonder what it says in the original language. What's the problem here? Uh, Strong's is your first guide uh, to find out. Now the, the definitions aren't usually that extensive um, so they're pretty simple definitions and if you want to get super scholarly well then you're going to need a more advanced tool. Um, but for our purposes that's the way Strong's was intended to be used. Now, I do have a word of caution uh, for using Strong's. And it's the impression that we give. We never want to give the impression to anybody that we're, we're discipling or mentoring, anybody in our small group, that the only way to understand the Bible is to know another language. Uh, we never want to give that impression because that can be very damaging. We want to always give the impression, and because it's largely true, that the Bible can be basically understood. Particularly if you're using an easy-to-use translation, but it's understandable. And that they shouldn't be afraid of reading their Bible by themselves. That, you know what, you can get what's into this, and you don't need a fancy-schmancy degree in order to do that. Uh, a classic mistake that brand-new pastors who are right out of seminary make is this mistake, is because we've spent ridiculous countless hours looking at vocabulary flashcards, studying grammars and all these other different languages. And the first sermons that we give are usually, you know, original Greek and original Hebrew. You know, it says this, 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 and in Hebrew, it's ah, ah, ah. Hebrew's horrible, sounds like Klingon. Um, but 
Uh, that's what, you, what you'll get from a rookie, rookie pastor. And the impression he gives is, wow, that guy's really, really smart, uh, but I have no idea what he's talking about. And clearly this Bible thing is something that I can't get, uh, which is the opposite of the impression we're, we're trying to get. So what I would recommend, if you do use Strong's Concordance, uh, during your study, if the discussion comes around, what does this word mean? Just mention that, you know, I actually looked this up, you know, the original language meant that. You don't even have to say what the original language was. You don't have to say the word in another language. But just say, you know, in the original language, it meant this. Um, now, I don't think Strong's gives you this much depth, but an important one in Scripture where we mess up a lot uh, has to do with the word heart. Now, in English, in the 21st century, the word heart uh, figuratively, I mean, obviously it refers to the blood pump, but figuratively, heart refers to the seat of our emotions that we think with our head and we feel with our heart. Heart is where the feels are. Uh, in the Bible, uh, the seat of your emotions is not your heart. Your emotions come from your bowels, uh, which immediately strikes us as weird, but that's where your emotions come from figuratively in the Bible. Now, we have that a little bit in English, where, you know, sometimes we'll get a, a gut instinct or a gut feeling. Uh, or if something really traumatic happens to you, you know, it felt like I got punched right in the gut. So we can identify a little bit, but it means something very different. In the Bible, the word heart means the core or center of something. So in English, we still have a little bit of this. Uh, when we're dealing with carpentry, the heartwood is the stuff that's right at the center. Or we talk about getting to the heart of the matter. We're not talking about getting to the emotions of the matter, but the real, the core, the center of things. Um, but it's helpful to know that when we read our Bible, when the Bible talks about anything to do with our heart, it's talking about the core and center of who we are. It's not necessarily talking about our emotions. Uh, and fortunately, the Bible does not spend a lot of time talking about bowels, so that's good too. Um, but that's sort of an overview of Strong's Concordance. Uh, the last tool I'm going to talk about, and it's my favorite, is the topical analysis of the Bible by Walter Elwell. Um, I know you guys have received this already and had a chance to take a look at it. And for those of you who are watching this online, if you don't already own this book, own this book. Uh, my, this isn't my, my personal copy. My personal copy of Topical Analysis of the Bible is tattered and worn and beaten um, because I use it a lot. This is what I call the pastor's cheat book. This will save you crazy hours of prep time, whether you're preparing a talk, a message, a sermon, or a small group Bible study. And what this book is, is it will show you verses that talk about any given topic. So you look up any topic, and there's a huge index of subjects here. And overcoming sin, overcoming the world, uh, Christ is the overseer, uh, you can look up pain, you can look up parables, you can look up paradise, you can look up people of God, uh, the nature of baptism, the nature of the church, the nature of death. There's a huge number, it's a big book, uh, of subjects here. And when you find the subjects, uh, and I just flipped it open here, uh, the possessors of eternal life. Uh, those appointed for eternal life have it. And it gives us the verse, Acts 13, 42. And then it'll have the verse written out word for word. So it's not just a reference that, well, give me Bible verses and then I have to start flipping around in my Bible to find stuff. No, the verses are here. It's all in the NIV. But this is just verse after verse after verse uh, of so many different things. Uh, doctrinal things, theological things, uh, life application subjects. One of the reasons why I strongly encourage this is because the way we are doing this dynamic method of Bible study gives you as a small group leader the ability to choose the topic. And this is a tool uh, that helps you do that. 
Now, some would say that this method is utter madness. Um, allowing small group leaders to choose what passage to study uh, is just a recipe for crazy heresy. Uh, and there are a lot of church leaders who I admire and respect uh, who think that allowing small group leaders to choose whatever verse they want uh, and then lead a study based on that, that that is just irresponsible and reckless. Uh, and you are opening your church wide open uh, for false teaching. I don't agree with them. Uh, and I don't agree with them partially because of this Reformation principle, and this is filled with irony, uh, the perspicuity of Scripture. Perspicuity, and this is the ironic part, this word that doesn't make any sense means something that makes sense. Perspicuity means something that is understandable or clear, despite the fact that the word perspicuity isn't understandable. Um, but we believe that the Bible is basically understandable. That's one of the basic principles of the Reformation, that we don't need a pope necessarily to tell us what it means, that we can open up the Bible for ourselves and understand it. And we, I don't care what church you're at, we do encourage people to own their own Bibles, and we encourage them to read their own Bibles. Well, it makes sense that we would encourage them to study their own Bibles as well. This gives us uh, a lot of cool things. One of it is what I'd call theological agility. Um, and what I mean by that is, here at our church, Pastor Kelly might be doing a sermon series on tithing, which is great. But if you're leading a small group of teenage girls who are cutting themselves, you know what? Maybe tithing isn't the most important subject for them to be studying right now. Um, we want you to be agile enough to figure, okay, you know what? What our girls in my group need to understand is their identity in Christ. They need to understand their value. Um, of course, if you own topical analysis, boy, you can find that really fast. Uh, but we want you to be able to focus in on what your small group is do dealing with. We'd want you to do this personally too, that if you're cutting yourself, uh, even though Pastor Kelly was preaching about tithing, we'd want you to be able to find the right verse. If you're leading a small group uh, for couples and marriage is an issue, we want you to find the right verses on marriage and do that study not necessarily being confined to what the whole church is studying. That's the big reason why we do that. And a basic principle of discipleship. Uh, and I can't remember who told me this first, but it's something that's blatantly obvious. Uh, we feed children. Teenagers feed themselves, but adults feed others. Now, that's a principle we also see in uh, 1 John chapter 2. Um, when it comes to Scripture, yeah, you know what? We're going to have people who are spiritually children who need us to feed them. But it is our job as, as a church as a whole, and I'm not talking about just the organized church as in the pastoral staff, but I mean as the body of Christ, all of us, is to move people from being children where we have to feed them every little thing to move them to be teenagers where they can feed themselves. That we want the people in our small groups who may start off at this stage to eventually be familiar enough with the Bible uh, that if they have any kind of problem or struggle in their life, they know they, where they can find that in the Bible and they can feed themselves. And then, and this is the role you guys are in because you're taking a small group leaders class, the adults, your job is to feed others. Um, and that's sort of the whole purpose and strategy behind this uh, dynamic uh, Bible study method. Now, by doing the Bible dynamic method, which is what we're focusing on, that doesn't mean we should never use DVD curriculum, because sometimes I do use DVD curriculum. In fact, I'm starting uh, a small group tomorrow night that is based on DVD curriculum. Uh, I was in one last night that was based on DVD curriculum. So I'm not saying that we should never use other Bible study methods. Um, but this one is an especially powerful one. Uh, the weakness of DVDs is 
sometimes just sitting around watching TV together doesn't allow us to connect very deeply. Um, using prepackaged materials. Yeah, you know what? Sometimes they'll ask some good discussion questions, but if we don't understand what a question means, that author isn't in the room. Uh, he could be in Tennessee for all we know. Um, he's not there to rephrase the question, but if you're the ones coming up with the discussion questions and people don't understand what you're saying, you have the ability to rephrase right there. Uh, so it just gives you a lot more agility and in the end, I think teaches much better uh, biblical discipleship principles. Any questions? All right, that's the end of this class.